Welcome and good evening to one and all. This evening is the ninth lecture. We have a series on Hindu-Christian dialogue for fellowship. This evening, the presentation will be on Sri Sankara, the Sanyasin, the Advaitin, and the Bharata Ratna. The speaker is Augustine, Professor Dr. Augustine Totakara CMI, and uh, moderator will be Professor Dipavali Banat. So before I hand over the time to our moderator, I would like to uh, make a short introduction to the moderator and then the speaker. First, let me introduce the moderator for this evening, Dr. Dipali Bhanat. She is a former associate professor in the Department of Sanskrit at the DJM College, University of Delhi, where she taught for more than 40 years at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. She taught papers related to Vedas, Upanishads, Sanskrit literature and Indian culture. She also has a keen interest in the Indian art and culture and the Sanskrit Silpa Satras. She had been actively engaged in interfaith activities for more than three decades and has participated in a number of national and international interfaith seminars and conferences and presented papers. At present, Dr. Dipali Bhanat is one of the Associate Secretaries General and a member of the Executive Committee of Reliance for Peace Asia. She is also the co-chair of the Women of Faith Asia Pacific Network, Reliance for Peace Asia. She is very active and a very dynamic person. And she has also been closely associated with the Foklari movement and its activities for the past several years. We are happy to have her to moderate this evening session. And I also would like to introduce to you the speaker for this evening, Professor Augustine Totakara, CMI, who was the former Chancellor of Christ University and Rector of Dharamaram College, Bangalore. He is a world-renowned Indologist who taught at various universities abroad in India, like University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Rome, Pontifical Oriental Institute, Rome, Rajina Mundi, Rome, and Dharmaram Vidya Setram, Bangalore. He received his doctorate from the University of Lancaster, you know, uh, UK, and also did his postdoctoral studies under the celebrated Indologist, Professor Ninian Smart. He speaks French and German in addition to Sans Sanskrit, in which he has a title as Acharya. He is the author of many books like Vedanta Philosophy, a study of Varaduguru's Tatwasara, Self and Consciousness, Indian Interpretations, Women and Worship, etc. He is at present the Prior of Christ, the King Monastery, Garukuti. He belongs to the Carmelites of Mary Immaculate Congregation established by the by Saint Kuriakos Elias Chavra at Mananam in 1831. Kotakara was guide and supervisor of eight doctoral dissertations at the University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Rome in a span of 12 years. He was second reader of many doctoral dissertations in different ecclesiastical universities of Rome. He, also, he have also guided around 40 licensed theses such a great personality, great academician, and a great scholar is he. So we are so happy to uh, get his in-depth study 
on the subject of this evening topic. But unfortunately, due to some unavoidable circumstances, he is not able to present the paper today, but his work, his paper will be presented to us by the director, Father Matthew Chandran Kunel. So this is for your kind information. I hope Father will make it more lively and more vibrant <laughs> presentation to us this evening. So now I hand over the time to uh, Dipali Bhanat, and then I request her to, I mean, take care of the whole sessions. Over to you, ma'am. Can you please unmute, ma'am? Okay. Is it okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Yeah. Yeah, a very good evening to all and thank you, sir, for that introduction. And uh, I'm very thankful to ECC, Ramakrishna Math and the Focolari Movement for organizing this Hindu-Christian dialogue. And as uh, you have mentioned right now, the topic for today's lecture is Sri Shankara, the Sanyasi, the Advaitin and the Bharat Ratna. And as uh, Professor Augustine is away, Today, Professor Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunal, CMI, Director of ECC, who is also the General Secretary of ACI TSSCA, General Secretary of Vigil India, and Editor in Chief of the International Journal for Transformation of Consciousness, has very graciously accepted to present this paper for this evening session of Hindu Christian dialogue. I'm so thankful to him. And I sincerely thank him also for painstakingly transforming this entire long article by Professor Thotakar into a PowerPoint presentation for us so that we can understand the Vedantic philosophy of Advaitvat propounded by Sri Shankara of eighth century. And uh, he will also touch uh, briefly upon the Vishishta Dvaitavad of Sri Ramanujan of the 11th century and Dvaitavad of Madhvacharya of 13th century. Uh, when we talk of Sri Shankara, we talk of his Vedantic philosophy of the Advaitic, <coughs> Advaita Vedanta <coughs> or the Advaita philosophy. Advaita means the non-dualistic. So in this philosophy, which Vedanta also means the end of the Vedas, and that refers to the Upanishads. And according to Shankara, Brahma, that is the Parabrahma is the ultimate truth. He is the ultimate reality, and that is Nirguna, his attributeless Brahman. And the Jivatma, the individual soul, is identical to Paramatma, but due to ignorance, it stays in this mortal body and in this jagat, the universe. And this universe is uh, maya. It is unreal because it is also an illusion. Gachatiti jagat, because it keeps on changing from minute to minute. And this individual soul that dwells in our bodies is bound to this earth or this jagat, this universe, due to the karma siddhanta, the theory of karma. That is, we do a deed and the fruit of that action binds us. And due to avidya, ignorance, we treat this as real. And because of this, because of the deed, the action, and the fruit thereby, the Jivatma, the individual soul is bound to this earth, bound to this life. So it also tells us about the theory of the rebirth. So that is karma, karma phala, which results in the rebirth. And there is this long cycle of birth, life, birth, death, rebirth, till the person attains, or the Jivatma attains moksha, that is the spiritual liberation. And for that, a person has to go to a guru who is a Brahmanishtha guru. And this is the jnana marga. You see, in the Hindu philosophy, there are three kinds of marks. The jnana marga, that is the path of knowledge. Karma marga, the path of actions. 
and bhakti marg the path of devotion one can choose any one of these to attain the parabrahma so therefore to attain this nirguna brahma there has to be a person has to have three four qualities that means he should know about the permanent and the impermanent objects in this world also about that person should have total detachment from the fruits of the action whether here in this world or in the other world to have total control over the senses and to have a single one point desire to attain liberation from this bondage of birth and death and it is not necessary that a person has to die to attain that liberation a person can become a jivan mukt that means become liberate he can become liberate even when this body is here and that position of jivan mukti a person who can get liberated the upanishad say bhidyate hridaya granthi chindante sarva sanshaya kshiyante chasya karmani tasmin drishte paravare that means the when that person becomes mukta all the bondages of the karma break asunder and that person becomes one with god and the example given here is the similarity of the jivatma and the parmatma is like the air in a pot and the air outside when the earthen pot breaks you cannot differentiate similarly that moksha is like that so and it is also like the pure water when put into pure water you cannot tell the difference so that is the situation of moksha and uh, then uh, there is this other uh, philosophy of the dvaitavad and the vishesh dvaitavad which professor matthew is going to tell us about and we can discuss that later dvaitavad is the dual form that is they consider the jivatma and the parmatma to be two different forms and it is bhakti marg the path of devotion which connects them and in the vishesh advaita which is unique which uh, talks about the uh, jivatma parmatma uh, parmatma in this jagat there are three entities and parmatma is the antaryami is the soul that connects them together and complete surrender or sharanagati that is leads to parmatma so this is a brief introduction and now i request professor uh, Ma father matthew chandran kunnal to please tell us more about shri adi shankar acharya who was the greatest propounder of the advaita philosophy thank you father matthew please thank you uh, professor dr diwali bhanot uh, for the introduction and uh, you have given uh, a well uh, placed uh, path to this great mystic um, a transformer a person of transformation and a great uh, religious thinker and uh, maybe uh, this one hour or two hours is not enough to uh, explain about and to describe this great thinker um but i think uh, our uh, hindu christian uh, dialogue for fellowship is a way of initiation so that you know we will be able to know more about this great uh, mystic and then as we all know this advaita um, is a great intellectual uh, tribute uh, organized by uh, sri shankaracharya and um, he organized the hinduism because you know it was uh, buddhism it was prevailing and it was in decline so that way we see that um, shankaracharya is a kind of second founder or you know to come to prominence um, so that way we will be able to uh, give some information very valid valuable information and uh, given by uh, professor uh, dr agastin totakra who studied uh, sanskrit and he lived a life of a, a great intellectual in pro, uh, describing and uh, lecturing on shankaracharya vishishta advaita advaita and all uh, mathwa and all uh, hindu uh, themes so i will uh, place this um, lecture with sharing the screen
and uh, we will have a kind of uh, life description about shankaracharya then his uh, exponent of his life and also about his uh, what is advaita and then uh, there is also continuity with uh, advaita as professor dipali has already said visishta advaita and dvaita so these are all very prominent philosophical themes maybe you may feel it as drudgery and also you will have uh, lots of uh, sanskrit words uh, so this is what i am going to present and actually uh, professor agustin has given us a a, a very uh, big de detail about uh, the uh, presentation of uh, his uh, paper it is almost uh, 19 uh, pages so which uh, i will be sharing the screen now um so this is the the birthplace of uh, sri shankaracharya that is kaladi in kerala so we can see that uh, there is a, a huge temple so that is the the place where we call it as you know his birthplace and uh, uh, this is a monument and we can also see that the place where he has uh, been born uh, that is uh, into a, a monastery as well as a, a temple so kaladi is somewhere very close to uh, cochin maybe uh, around 20 kilometers away from uh, cochin and in his name uh, there is also a huge uh, uh, university which is known as sri shankaracharya university so you can see that uh, this is the the place and uh, there are, there is also a very close to that we also have uh, an airport but it seems that uh, that airport people many people wanted to give the name of shankaracharya but at that time the president was uh, uh, k r narayan he said that uh, uh, shankaracharya has some controversial uh, a figure uh, and therefore about the dalits and all those things so therefore uh, he vetoed otherwise uh, we could have uh, had uh, nadumbasheri airport as uh, sri shankaracharya airport so about his uh, sri shankaracharya's uh, life from um, it is said that you know 1788 uh, common era uh, till 820 common era so he was born in kaladi kerala and he died in kedarnath that is in uttarakhand so his uh, parents uh, aryamba and uh, shivaguru they did not have uh, children for many uh, years so it seems that aryamba and shivaguru uh, both of them were praying in trichur uh, there is a temple vadakunnathan temple a shiva temple so they were praying so they have uh, received uh, the blessing and then uh, they have this child and then uh, it seems that uh, uh, while he was very young his uh, father passed away so therefore uh, mother was maybe a very uh, possessive about him so therefore he did in, she did not want him to go but shankaracharya wanted to become a sanyasin and then he wanted to uh, go away from uh, in search of um, uh, his gurus but mother was very uh, vehement in uh, denying her so therefore one day it seems that there is the river periyar which we call it as also purna so he was taking bath and there was a crocodile uh, catching his leg and then uh, he told the mother if you are allowing me to go then uh, this crocodile will leave so it seems that you know fortunately the the crocodile left here uh, left him and then the mother allowed you go whatever you want but uh, we only want to uh, to to see you 
but uh, the mother pleaded with him that you know whenever i am on my deathbed you should come it seems that you know um, shankaracharya came on his uh, on her deathbed it seems that you know shankaracharya went away and then he became a, a monk a sanyasin therefore he could not uh, conduct the burial the funeral uh, to light the funeral pr- uh, pyre of his mother so therefore all the uh, brahmins who were nearby him uh, his family so they were protesting but he burst open the room he went inside and then uh, he said that yes my i promised to my mother i need to have so in a way we can say that you know he was very progressive he was breaking some of these ritualisms and then it seems that um, he could not by himself uh, taking the body of his mother so cut into pieces taken outside uh, and then uh, on uh, banana Uh, plants you know he placed and then uh, he fired and then he went back again and then uh, two families supported him those who were uh, staying um, near the head of his mother and then also to the uh, leg of his mother so they have uh, the talepallimana kalepallimana so it is also said that um, i also been to this place and uh, i have also a great uh, reverence to this sri shankaracharya i have been to joshimad badrinath and uh, gangotri and other places and in joshimad we also have the place where you know he was uh, meditating and uh, you will we will come to uh, see the place so i was wondering see in the 7th century i have seen that uh, joshimad is a very high mountain place and how in those days you know it was possible for him to walk from kerala to uttarakhand and from there even to uh, badrinath and uh, all over india he was a pilgrim he was going to assam kamakya and as well as uh, gujarat um, as well uh, to uh, puri jagannath so all these places he made uh, uh, monasteries and it is a, so that way we could see that you know he was a sanyasin and he was so dynamic and active but uh, he was all the more great intellectual so we, in a wholeness though uh, he was revering um, shaiva tradition following the shaiva tradition uh, shiva uh, parama shiva as mahendra Uh, he was revering but also he was following uh, krishna vishnu all those uh, traditions and one of the his poems uh, we could hear that uh, you know bhaja um, govindam bhaja govindam govindam bhaja bodamathe so that you know that you should uh, be to uh, pray to the uh, govinda so that way you know he was integrating so he was a person of uh, holism that is also we uh see that and who were uh, his uh, gurus his uh, primary guru was govinda pada govinda pada was uh, near to the the great river of narmada and it seems that he did not want to teach anyone uh, but he, he was uh, shankaracharya was so persistent went there and then he uh, repeated Uh, a sloka and hearing that uh, govinda pada asked him to come and then he learned from him and also from uh, govinda pada's master gauda pada so we see that from whatever possible ways he wanted to acquire knowledge shankaracharya acquired knowledge there is also an incident while shankaracharya with his disciples were in uh, varanasi there, there was a chandala chandala is the one you know outcast so one chandala was coming with his dogs and also a pot filled with uh, liquor and then shankaracharya with his disciples were coming and then shankaracharya uh, asked him give way <laughs> then you know this chandala uh, asked him what do you mean to whom i should uh, give way whether to this body or whether to the the self and then uh, he went on arguing that you know uh, what is this and you preach great things about uh, holism and then uh, this uh, advaita and all 
so what is it? then all on a sudden he understood that you know this chandala is uh, uh, shiva is in the form of this chandala he learned from him and he gave the way so that way shankaracharya was uh, capable of receiving knowledge uh, from anyone then uh, we also see that he has um, uh, he had great uh, disciples and um, uh, two four important Uh, disciples are patmapada todaka acharya hastamalaka and sureshwara so i will uh, uh, explicate about them maybe a little uh, uh, later so uh, shankaracharya was a great author he wrote many books he was a reformer and he was a mystic he was a pilgrim he was a sanyasin so we can have any number of adject- adjectives and uh, he was someone who uh, uh, had given see we see that in uh, hinduism we have the plurality of forms of worship any tree or a stone or idol or you know we have uh, numerous maybe millions and millions of but interpreting the upanishads bhagavad gita uh, the shruti literature he came up with that the reality is undivided there is only one so and then uh, he comes out with the, what is popular that is saguna brahman and the nirguna brahman as uh, professor dibali was already uh, speaking about so we can go later so these are so these are uh, shankaracharya's disciples uh, patmapada todagacharya hastamalaga sureshwara and uh, professor uh, agastin totakara he used to uh, claim himself as you know totaka acharya because maybe his family name is also totakara so he has a very um, affinity towards uh, totaka acharya and some earlier his email uh, was said to be totaka acharya and then uh, gmail.com and so that way he was very uh, close to uh, this uh, totaka acharya Uh, so all this uh, many of the things i have uh, already travel all over india created a system of rituals broken uh, rituals at uh, the mother's death and then uh, we also see that you know um, shankara digvijaya what is the, this digvijaya he was uh, he was into intellectual debate with every great proponents so he uh, as an example we have uh, uh, kumarila bhatta so he was one of the mimamsa so we have uh, uh, the the shat darsanas uh, six darsanas so one among them uh, is mimamsa purva mimamsa uttara mimamsa we have uh, uh, sankhya yoga uh, vedanta all the other six systems and uh, mimamsa was one among them kumarila patta could not debate it seems that you know kumarila patta in order to debate in order to defeat the buddhist he became a prachanna buddha uh, so he became a monk lived in a monastery learned about them and uh, the knowledge and then he started Uh, debating with them and defeating them so um, he uh, since he did in such a way that uh, he cheated his uh, master or you know guru so therefore he said that uh, i will do penance and uh, he was uh, in a uh, fire burning to death and then he came there he wanted to uh, shankaracharya came to him and said i want to de- uh, debate with him uh, but uh, then kumarila said i could not i am about to die so you go to mandana misra uh, and then you have the uh, uh, debate with him so uh, shankaracharya went to mandana misra and then he was about to uh, conduct a, 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 a puja but uh, mandana misra was a householder his wife uh, bharati and then they were uh, doing uh, all kinds of a very active person and a sanyasin is there so he did not like it but um, shankaracharya uh, insisted and then mandana misra uh, said that on condition that you know whoever is being defeated uh, he will become the follower of the other one and then who became uh, the moderator it was bharati bharati was the wife of uh, mandana misra so it seems that you know um, days and days of debate was there and then ultimately uh, bharati uh, the moderator knew that mandana misra is 
going to be failed you know what she did uh, a sanyasin will be given bhiksha so therefore bharati asked mandana misra and shankaracharya both of them to come uh, uh, the next day to receive bhiksha that means both of them should be, receive uh, bhiksha and become sanyasin so that was the, the condition and then uh, bharati since uh, her husband was defeated she uh, was asking uh, many more questions and then uh, she was saying that how, what can you speak about you know the the sexuality uh, and the other things and then um, as a sanyasin and a nashtika brahmacharin shankaracharya could not give any answer he said uh, well give me a a month and then it seems that you know he became uh, he entered into the body of a king um, there in varanasi who was on the funeral pile get up and then knew about it and uh, he also defeated uh, uh, bharati so it seems that you know he was a, he conquered all kinds of knowledge so we have in uh, uh, sarvajna pita in karnataka and then sharada pidam in kashmir so uh, shankaracharya is the one uh, who conquered all these different uh, intellectual uh, pathways so uh, his uh, disciples patmapada uh, it seems that you know whether i have heard it as in uh, Gan- uh, in narmada river and uh, some others say that it is in ganges but it is at, uh, uh, is in the ganges so patmapada was so devoted and then uh, it seems that narmada or ganges it was flooded and shankaracharya wanted to have uh, to change the uh, with the clean clothes and patmapada was on the other side you cannot cross so what uh, you know in his devotion patmapada stepped into the the river and he was walking and wherever he was stepping there was lotus flowers so therefore later patmapada is uh, named as you know who has the 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 feet of uh, lotus so therefore it is patmapada so patmapada is uh, one of the w- w- uh, four important so he is the one and literally means the one with the lotus foot uh, foot and uh, patmapada founded tekke madam a monastery in uh, uh, trichur next one is todakacharya it seems that you know todakacharya did not have uh, enough uh, intellectual capacity all the others were ridiculing him so therefore uh, shankaracharya but he liked the devotion of todakacharya so he transferred the wealth of his knowledge to todaka and then he became uh, todakacharya uh, so a great intellectual exponent and uh, he also established a monastery in trichur vadakemadam then uh, there is another one hasta malaga when shankaracharya visited the village near kollu kollur mugambiga a brahmin named prabhagara came forward along with his son to meet him prabhagara told him that his son is a lunatic and that he is good for nothing shankaracharya looked at his son and asked him few questions the boy then replied in verses uh, which explained advaita philosophy amazed by his knowledge shankaracharya named him hastamalaga and accepted him as his disciple hastamalaga founded idail madam in uh, in trichur that is in kerala then uh, this is the uh, sureshwara uh, uh, mandana misra so he was defeated and uh, he became uh, the disciple of sri shankara an ardent uh, disciple and uh, he established naduvil madam in trichur so all the four they have uh, one madam in trichur so uh, shankaracharya established also uh, uh, four pitas uh, shringeri sharada pidam this was the first monastery uh, founded by adi shankaracharya it is located in the southern part of india along the banks of tungabhadra river sureshwara uh, sureshwara you know mandana misra was made the head of this mat as shankaracharya moved uh, on to establish other mats shringeri sharada pidam advocates aham brahmasmi so that is their uh, motto dwaraka peed that is uh, in gujarat uh, it was uh, taken care by hastamalaga acharya his disciple and uh, uh, advocates tattvamasi 
that thou art so that is the philosophical then jodir mata peed uh, that is in uh, Ut uh, uttarakhand uh, joshimat uh, i am atmam brahmam and uh, it was uh, by todagacharya then we have uh, govardhana uh, mat that is in puri and it was uh, uh, by uh, patmapada so uh, the, the motto there is that pratyanam brahmam that is consciousness is brahman so as i uh, said that you know Buddh buddhism was uh, prevalent all over and we see that uh, great intellectual contributions by nalanda vikramashila and uh, many other universities so sarvam uh, then uh, shankara came and through the this uh, digvijaya uh, debates uh, it seems that you know spread uh, the power and glory of hinduism so uh, something about uh, buddhism sarvam dukkhamayam sarvam uh, chanigam sarvam shunyam so these are the buddhist tenets and shankaracharya reformed hinduism and made intellectual debates with the buddhist monks and made uh, the uh, the digvijaya monistic interpretation of hinduism so uh, this is uh, now we become more and more uh, highly intellectual uh, there are many uh, uh, people uh, monks or leaders who were in debating with uh, buddhism kumarila bhatta mandana misra then uh, these are all the the names shankara uh, uh, parashapta pada vaisheshya scholar prabhagara misra so all this uh, you can read uh, so how uh, he so on the popular level with the spread of the bhakti movement in hinduism one of the greatest advantages of buddhism was the figure and personality of the buddha himself the towering figure of the buddha which excluded serenity tranquility and peace and invited all to take refuge in him was the greatest as asset and wealth of early buddhism to counter this hinduism uh, uh, projected gods like krishna rama shiva and others as great heroes of hinduism even accepted the buddha as one of the incarnation of uh, vishnu in uh, vaishnava hinduism the historic gautama buddha is considered to be an incarnation avatar of the hindu god vishnu of the 10 uh, major incarnation of vishnu vaishnavites believe that gautama buddha is the ninth and most recent incarnation of lord uh, vishnu Uh, what concerns us uh, here is the accusation that sri shankara tacitly permitted the murder of buddhists by hindus particularly the massacre of buddhists at the hands of hindu fanatics at nagarjuna konda in andhra pradesh scholars believe that sri shankara as uh, condemned and hostility to buddhism was so intense and so uh, rancorous that he allowed hindus to annihilate buddhism listen to vivekananda and uh, such was the heart of the shankara that he burned to death lots of buddhist monks by defeating them in the argument what can you call such an action on shankara's part except fanaticism this is by uh, swami vivekananda in his complete works uh, calcutta 1997 it was published so it is a documented one so uh, one of his great aims uh, was to Con the conquest of buddhism um so uh, we have the only means to break the cycle of birth death and rebirth and thus attain the final uh, liberation from bondage is knowledge jnana so he became um, following the through the path of uh, the sanyasa and uh, it is imperative that every uh, mumukshu one who is desires of liberation practices sanyasa so he gave uh, importance to sanyasa renouncement advaitins preached that religious rites ritual sacrifices image worship even temple cults etc are futile and are ultimately to be transcended they developed also an abiding contempt for householders whose duty it is of to rituals and sacrifice and the mimamsakas who who are the proponents of brahminic sacrifices and household ritual, rituals considered even the site of a sanyasin as inauspicious and ominous we need, we we understand that you know the the debate between mandana misra and uh, shankaracharya it seems that shankaracharya always considered that refuting and defeating the mimamsakas 
in debates was one of his important missions the defeat of mandana misra at the hands of shankara and his consequent conversion to advaita and shankara's encounter with kumari lafatta the greatest mimamsa after jaimini and shabara are to be seen in this context so uh, we see that you know the uh, mimamsaga and the vedanta so uh, they are diametrically opposed in their world views vision of life and its exigencies spiritual philosophical tenets meaning for liberation vedanta considers renunciation sanyasa is an effective means to lead the seeker to this knowledge mimamsa strongly advocates that karma action performance of duty and not knowledge is the means for eternal liberation mimamsa is the philosophy of householders it detests sanyasins basically mimamsa is atheistic it does not believe in a creator god god is unnecessary hypothesis so now the what are the basic uh, tenets and uh, principles of advaita so these are all from upanishads it is uh, brahma satyam jagat mithya atma brahmaiva na idaraha brahma brahman is real world is unreal individual self is brahman itself they are not different vidyaya amrutam asnude one enjoys the immortality by knowledge ekam eva advaidiyam reality is one without the second ekam sat vipra behuda vadanti reality is the only one the learned people express it differently the four mahavakyas great sentences sentences namely pratyanam brahma brahman is consciousness aitireya upanishad i am atmam brahmam this self is brahman mandukya upanishad tattva masi thou art that chandogya upanishad aham brahmasmi i am brahman brahadaranya upanishad brahman is an impersonal absolute and its essence consciousness brahman is consciousness it has no name no form no attributes so uh, there are the what is the reality according to uh, shankara there are three layers of reality what is the the actual reality it is paramarthika sat that is the third one the permanent the perfect and true reality is the only one and not two and that is the spiritual reality brahman the only reality existing is paramarthika satya that is the spiritual reality the brahman and the other two vyavaharika that is the phenomenal and uh, the illusory pradipasika so the reality is actually three paramarthika vyavaharika and pradipasika so among them which is the reality it is the spiritual reality that is brahman there is nothing else and uh, the next one is brahman is the ultimate only reality the essential thesis of advaita uh, are that there is only one true reality everything besides this reality is not real in essence this one reality is pure consciousness without attributes the individual self is brahman itself and not different the only sure means of for liberation is knowledge jnana marga as uh, professor divali uh, said which is the experiential and intuitive awareness of the identity of the individual self with the brahman brahman for advaita vedanta is a name for that fullness of being which is the content of non dualistic spiritual experience an experience in which all distinctions between subject and object are shattered and in which remains only a pure unqualified oneness the reality is only one but why we we are then he is also speaking about you know the two types of uh, brahman the the reality as we are craving for form name we have saguna brahman and uh, we also have nirguna brahman that is formless nameless attributeless so the only reality is the nirguna brahman beyond the forms 
beyond uh, all kinds of um, attributes. So this is uh, what uh, uh, the, the ultimate reality, there is only one reality, but why we are perceiving many realities? And what is the, uh, yeah, actually uh, the Jivatman, that is, you know, the personal self or, you know, the individual uh, uh, life. The reality is only one. What is the status of Jiva? Commenting on the Vedanta Sutras, Sri Shankara says that the individual self is atomic in nature. It is an agent and is a manifestation of the Supreme Brahman. And he says that, you know, it is a reflection. And then uh, he is also speaking in terms of the ports or the container. The reality is only one, uh, but it can be contained in different. So it is only the reflection of uh, the great one reality. And then what about the matter, the world, the physical body? He says that these are all illusion. Matter and the plurality of the world, according to Shankara, are illusion. It disappears when the real knowledge of the real nature of Brahman is realized. Ignorance is the cause of this wrong uh, uh, perception. So what it causes? Ignorance, avidya. Like the body, senses, mind, etc. But in fact, these phenomenal realities are only superimposed on the self. The identification with the body and matter makes the self think that he, she is a doer, enjoyer, knower, etc. As long as this false identification continues, the individual self is condemned to the vicious circle of actions, birth, death, and rebirth. Sri Shankara. However, does not say that the world is absolutely false. It has a relative uh, existence, Vyavahariga, and is relatively true to the time being, that is, in the state of ignorance. So if we are in ignorance, there will be the physical reality. So how we are experiencing the physical reality, it is because of the Maya. Maya illusion is a central concept in the philosophy of Sri Shankara. It is through the application of this comparatively vague concept that Sri Shankara argues the oneness of reality, that is Advaita. Maya or ignorance is not a real entity. We can neither say that it exists nor it does not exist. It is a mystery which is beyond our understanding. It is unspeakable, anirvajaniya. As Maya is not real, cannot be related to Brahman, the reality, in any way whatsoever, for the relation between the truth and falsehood is impossible. The relation of is an apparent and therefore Brahman is in no way affected by this illusion, which is superimposed upon it, even as the rope is not affected by the snake that is assumed to exist in it. So what is an illusion? He is giving an example that, you know, seeing a rope, we will have the illusion that it will be a snake. So that is the way we are because of ignorance. But the true knowledge will lead us to the true reality. Maya and Adhyasa are related. It is because of the Maya that superimposition takes place. Superimposition says, Shankara is the apparent presentation to consciousness by way of remembrance of something previously observed in some other thing. It is an apparent presentation that is knowledge which, which is subsequently falsified. In other words, it is illusion of knowledge. So there are the sadhana uh, chadushtaya, the four spiritual means. Uh, uh, discernment between eternal and non-eternal entities, non-attachment to the results of actions, employment of spiritual disciplines like self-control, control of senses, dispassion, forbearance, concentration of mind and faith, the intense desire for liberation, mumukshutva. These means will eventually lead the spiritual aspirant to the self-realization. Upanishads suggest practice of various virtues and values to arrive at the stage of enlightenment, which is to be obtained by the intuitive, experiential, and mystical knowledge of the divine. There are the, the three spiritual means, listening, reflection, and contemplation. That is, sravana, manana, and nidityasana. And then how you can uh, uh, achieve Jivan Mukti. Shankara's Advaita also teaches the possibility of liberation while living. 
the seeker through the proper practices of spiritual means can destroy all the results of actions karma this means he is or she is liberated from the bondage of nations avidya forever still he may continue to exist in body for the benefit of others this state of being liberated while living is known as jivan mukti it is like the rotation of a wheel a wheel starts rotating by an external force but even if this external force is removed the wheel continues to rotate on its own for some more time it is like that even if the self has destroyed all the results of karma and is mature to enter the state of liberation it may continue to exist in physical body for some more time such holy person is qualified as jivan mukta other systems of indian philosophy and other branches of vedanta stoutly deny the possibility of salvation in the embodied existence uh, so these are uh, shankaracharya's advaita and uh, about him and then uh, uh, something more about you know we have a uh, different uh, visishta advaita by ramanujarya of the 11th century and then uh, of the 13th century by madhvacharya i am giving only a very uh, uh, simple uh, explanation because this itself will be for more than uh, two hours of lecture um, uh, ramanujarya was born uh, in sri perimbadur and he died in sri rangam and uh, he was Uh, in the time of chola uh, dynasty and we could see that you know he was devoted to the uh, vishnu and uh, he considered that you know vishnu is the only reality and then um, uh, the vishishta advaita means you know qualified monism so what is the, there in the qualified monism it is only uh, the uh, Uh, paramatman is the the reality and then uh, there is also uh, the atman jivatman so th- they are uh, two entities or a qualified entity that is what and uh, for dvaida uh, that is madhvacharya uh, krishna as the ultimate reality bhakti devotion uh, surrender so more of the the bhakti movement both of them were uh, while shankara had uh, the the jnana both emphasize the saguna uh, brahman the reality so we could see that you know the gradation shankaracharya uh, brahman is formless nameless there is no nama and there is no rupa but ramanujarya uh, considered that you know uh, vishishta advaita qualified monism vishnu as the ultimate reality and uh, for madhvacharya it is krishna so you could see that you know the gradation in the levels of the supreme reality so what are the these differences the differences depend upon the interpretations of the reality brahman that is the paramatman the ultimate reality and the jivatman individual soul and the jagat how they are interrelated paramatman as swatantra independent independent while jivatman and jagat dependent on paramatma and hence paratantra so this is the way vishishta advaita is explaining uh, that qualified monism vishishta advaita that is um, jivatman and jagat they are dependent they are paratantra and only the independent reality is paramatman Uh, for vishishta advaita jiva and jagat are in com- incomplete parts and paramatman bind them together to a whole jivatman and jagat body of paramatman and uh, paramatman as the inner controller andriyamin sharanagati prapatti complete uh, surrender to the paramatman so the the bhakti movement that is the vishishta advaita and then uh, for the vishishta advaita we have the four uh, layers a uh, salokyam quality of being in the same uh, same world as the ultimate reality same worldness um samlepyam being proximity to the ultimate reality sarupyam same form as that of the ultimate reality sayujyam completely fused into the ultimate reality and then uh, what is dvaita of uh, madhvacharya paramatman and jivatman are two entities paramatman only one while jivatman can be many 
and the bhakti is the only way to eternal salvation so what we can uh, see uh, from uh, shankaracharya and uh, this are the other so we have uh, the advaita vedanta vishishta advaita vedanta and madhvacharya's dvaita so the shankaracharya comes with the concept that you know there is only one reality paramarthika satya and it is arupa amurta nameless formless nameless advaita philosophy has similarities with the philosophy of the myst- uh, the mystic meister eckhart a german mystic and follower of st thomas aquinas that uh, 12th century 13th century st thomas aquinas uh, 16th century uh, mystic meister eckhart and the meister eckhart has written down the whole philosophy of uh, st thomas aquinas into much more um, a profound philosophical way uh, through uh, the german and uh, i could say that you know some of the uh, the words like you know grund uh, that means you know the foundation abgrund what is beyond uh, the the grund uh, that is the the foundation and then gelasen height so many expressions of meister uh, eckhart has been taken by heidegger in order to interpret this uh, philosophy so uh, what i uh, found between uh, the christian interpretation of meister eckhart and uh, that of uh, shankaracharya is that you know we have to go beyond the nameless the formless and the ultimate reality is nameless formless nameless it is nirguna brahma and then uh, in dharmaram where uh, father uh reverend dr agustin totakara and the others you know they made so many bhajans sanskrit bhajans and one of these uh, bhajans is arupa mahatma chidananda sara avidya viruddham vivekam taruni tamasin krudanda taruni prakasham ajada nitanda suchaidanya meku what is that arupa means nameless and you are the great and you are the consciousness and uh, uh, you are uh, against um, uh, ignorance and you give us wisdom and you are uh, the dispeller of darkness give us light the one who is not born and everlasting and give us the ultimate reality i think when we speak about shankara this would be a great prayer we can also make and uh, with this i think uh, i will uh, uh, complete uh, my lecture and i request uh, milun uh, so that you know this uh, one of the uh, fathers has written uh, from dharmaram they have written uh, this and then another great uh, musician uh, singer uh, he sang and then meditatively we can uh, listen to uh, that uh, song maybe it will be 3 minutes Uh, so that will be a kind of you know as a sanyasin uh, shankaracharya was giving us uh, this great way of meditation as a way of reaching out to the ultimate reality so let us listen to uh, this uh, song and uh, after that we will have the further discussion <laughs>
Thank you for the patient listening. You have to open the valley. Yes. Thank you so much, Father Matthew, for this lucid explanation of the such a dry topic of the Advaita philosophy. And I am sure everybody has enjoyed your talk, and we look forward to the questions. So if you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat box and let us see if we can solve them for you. Yeah, if so they, were, they want, they can either uh, place there or you can, they can ask, they can raise their yes. um, hands or, you know, there is the um, reactions place there, you know, you can definitely ask. So, so far in the chat box, I have from Jeevan Babu. So wonderful lecture, honorable sir, wonderful bhajan. And from RSV, Sukumar says, thank you very much, Father, for this groundbreaking presentation on the life of Adi Shankaracharya. Kindly explain more about any dances related with Advaita Vedanta in the seventh or eighth centuries. Dances. Uh, Sukumar, could you explain what is? Uh... Yeah. Uh, Father, thank you for this. Thank you for this amazing presentation. It is really touching for me. I listen to this music, amazing music in Malayalam lyrics. I'm just curious to know were there any dances also those days? Ah, okay, okay, That's okay. My... Yes, uh, there are also dance uh, recitals. Um, actually, um, I just only wanted to uh, present the song, but you know, the, the, uh, on the video, um, YouTube, it was only presented with some pictures and all. Otherwise, you know, when we are presenting about Aruba, Mahatma, there should not have been anything, just only for uh, listening. And I have also uh, some uh, of my, my friends, Christians as well as Hindus, they went to the Kailas. So it was a, a pilgrimage. And as uh, both the Christians and the Hindus told me, and it is also one of my desire to go to Mount Kailas and to make uh, that Girivalam, that production uh, around. Parikrama. Ah, th uh, yes. Uh, what do you call? Parikrama. Ah, Parikrama. So I think it is almost the same. Going, uh, we around, have, yeah. uh, going around in the South India. 
we have uh, in arunachala that is you know uh, where um, we have uh, the uh, ramana maharshi so there they call it as girivalam so i attended a few times that girivalam and the parikrama there so those friends uh, they were as you are going into the high mountain ranges what you will experience is that you know you won't see any temples you won't see any of these uh, murtis and you are one with the divine with the nature so as we are climbing up into the spiritual levels i am absolutely sure that there is no hindu god there is no christian god there is no muslim god there is only nirguna brahma there is only the ultimate divine there is only one reality and uh, if you are reaching to that level then yeah, what is uh, sukumar you are asking that you know you will be dancing with the whole of your body you will be in prostrate and you will be unified that was exactly what shankaracharya was telling there is only one reality and whatever the uh, everything else is maya illusion and it is because of your ignorance yeah uh, so father i think his question was uh, whether there were any dances related to advaita vedanta in the 7th 8th centuries i think uh, the dances and the songs were more related to the bhakti movement and also uh, shankaracharya although he believed in the nirguna brahma but he also wrote you know uh, certain verses to the uh, saguna brahma for example the bhajagovindam etc so it is only in bhakti movement that people are go into a trance and they that is a total uh, surrender to god the saguna the attribute the god with attributes but to the nirguna the attributeless the formless uh, brahman it is only pure knowledge that can get a person mukti the liberation so therefore i think for shankaracharya uh, he only went through the gyana marga then we have other comments um, samuel john dinkara thank you for that wonderful presentation father amen awesome samuel sunit thank you father for an amazing presentation it was so peaceful to listen to the bhajan Sherilyn says thank you for the presentation could you explain a bit more on the hindu buddhist relations at the time of adi shankara and what happened in eventually that is a question here yeah so um the buddhist uh, uh, hindu relations i think it is a uh, very controversial very complex uh, question and uh, may not be able to give a uh, holistic answer in just one uh, small question you need you can see that um, buddhism can be considered as a renaissance in uh, because there are various other ways of interpretation that uh, hinduism uh, through the ritualism there were more and then um, uh, buddhism came as uh, as a kind of a renaissance and they have the uh, uh, buddham sharanam dharmam sharanam sangham sharanam so they have the community they have uh, the the buddha and uh, the, uh, there is also the dharma so all this uh, were there and then uh, it became a, a kind of pali instead of the sanskrit and it became a great movement and it became a great intellectual movement you could see that uh, by the second century we have uh, nalanda university then we have vikramashila then um, uh, a few other uh, uh, odantapura so many uh, at least six uh, such great universities i had the opportunity to be in the nalanda university more than six times and uh, mm. it it seems that you know those days there were more than 10000 monks there so what they were carrying uh, there you know it was the debates and not only on the spiritual level but all other so you could see that uh, buddhism became a, a very prominent religious tradition and an intellectual uh, debate intellectual movement and then 
how to counter this so that was maybe uh, shankaracharya and then many others uh, you know uh, mandara misra uh, kumarila bhatta so kumarila bhatta became a buddhist monk he wanted to know what exactly it is uh, the, the reality so therefore uh, he went inside the monastery he became a, a kind of a buddhist monk knew what it is and then uh, taking the counter measures Uh, we also see that kumarila bhatta uh, and uh, also mandana misra his disciples uh, they were all uh, doing the same so gradually uh, we see that an intellectual debate uh, between and uh, from the 6th century uh, onwards and by the 12th century you could see that buddhism is on decline and then uh, what was the reason i think uh, there are also internal uh, problems within uh, the uh, the buddhism um there is also the external uh, muhammad gori it seems that you know muhammad gori uh, muhammad gasni so he came and then so that you know the huge university uh, there at nalanda he asked do you have um, quran they said we don't have any any quran here it's only the buddhist then he said then there is no point in having such a big library then he burned it so uh, so this is the the way we could uh, uh, hear that the, the decline even the great monks huyan sang fakian and many others who came from um, china tibet and the others we, we we see that you know they are taking away the, the great uh, books translating into chinese and tibet and then uh, they were uh, moving uh, away unfortunately we don't have any real Uh, buddhist tradition here we have the neo buddhism by uh, ambedkar uh, but we now uh, from the tibet uh, we have dalai lama his, his holiness dalai lama and the others so there are various reasons uh, between this debates buddhism uh, and uh, hinduism but we could also see that as shankaraj uh, the others they claim that you know the vaishnava tradition vishnu's one of the incarnations is considered as they have incorporated uh, um, buddha as avatars of vishnu so that way there were also the bhakti movement so various other uh, movements also uh, came in in order to counter and uh, we hear uh, shankara digvijaya an intellectual debate so he was the one and then he made the four monasteries in four parts of india and from there you know the renovation the reforming of uh, the hindu traditions and then we could see that you know he might have experienced that what is lacking in hinduism that you know the pluralistic everything as god everything so either the tree or the animal or uh, the stone or anything so he came up with this nirguna brahma the reality yeah. is only one so i think these are the ways and then today we can uh, great many intellectuals are holding to this shankara sadvaita so if you ask them what kind of religion you are what kind of philosophy you are advaita so so that became a prominent so we can go on explaining more about this so cherry line i hope that <laughs> this will be a, a simple answer to a, a very complex question yeah thank you father uh, father well, with your permission can i also add here yeah please uh, you, yeah because you see all the teachings of shankaracharya or it was ramajana or ramanuja or madhavacharya all these teachings were in sanskrit actually buddha buddhism and shankaracharya were uh, close to each other so they were in sanskrit and sanskrit belong to the elitist class of the society it was not accessible so the all the literature the vedas the scriptures the shruti the mm. shruti was not available to the masses because it was in the sanskrit language and buddhism when it began they used the local language or the upper branch of which was pali it was the common people's language so therefore buddhism was becoming more and more popular and therefore uh, these people although they were bitter enemies uh, these uh, philosophers they all uh, worked together to defeat buddhism and uh, for example you have also mentioned and uh, professor has also mentioned that there was the mass killing of the buddhists so the buddhists escaped from here 
and that is why we find so little buddhism uh, existing in india at that time and we find now buddhism spread into far east southeast asia and uh, east asia and uh, in india we have uh, hardly any buddhist that kind of buddhism left even in uh, sri lanka you will find the buddhism is existing and this whole process of debate debate was always it was called the shastrartha one just could not claim that i am the greatest thinker or one has to to prove himself even now if you go down to dharmashala and if you see the tibetan monks studying in that dharmashala you will find the uh, the children or the uh, monks who are there they are all debating they will say a point and the other one will contradict it and you have to so it was like you have to prove whatever you are saying with proof so that that is how you win a debate it's not by just saying so uh, that is why the hindu buddhist uh, relationship was a very uh, delicate issue at that time and i think that is why we do not find so much buddhism here and uh, when the buddhists escape they took all the uh, manuscripts etc with them and if you go down to dharmshala uh, uh, or any other place you will find sheets and sheets of manuscripts you know rolled together and kept in their libraries which is still preserved today thank you father thank you diwali for these uh, further explanations could, could i could i just uh, ask another always related to the same um, because yes it led to the to buddhism being expelled from india but what were the main um, uh topics of debate uh, or contradiction let's say there was the rebirth or what what were the points of uh, huge or let's say the main points of huge debate between buddhism and hinduism i think uh, it must be about what is the reality what is the meaning of life and uh, these are two uh, different perspectives they have both you know the philosophical foundation as uh, birth rebirth both they have uh, karma they also buddhism uh, also claim but other than that um, what is the ultimate aim what is the purpose of human life and how do you p- perceive whether it is uh, jivan mukti or uh, you have nirvana so and then uh, uh, using many philosophical uh, expressions because even in buddhism you will find that you know too many uh, different uh, uh, paths it is not only even the tibetan buddhism there are four and uh, if you uh, the meditative ways of zen buddhism actually uh, dhyan that is the word and it went to china it became zen that is meditation dhyan jan and it became uh, went to uh, uh, there in um, um yeah actually very far away in japan it became zen so what is zen nothing yeah. other than dhyan but you could see that you know uh, not only the the word changing but it is also there are the different meditative uh, forms as an example what is the meditative processes in uh, tibetan buddhism as well as in uh, zen buddhism tibetan buddhism you see that you know buddha uh, so you visualize there is a visualization uh, you also have you know mantra um, you visualize buddha and then um, uh, you will be becoming a buddha but in zen buddhism it is a, again uh, maybe even from yoga you could say chitta vritti nirodha that means you know all the thought processes are eliminated so that way zen is that you know you simply a formless meditative processes so uh, their debates were more of not about the birth or rebirth Uh, and other uh, incarnations but uh, of the, the philosophical what is uh, the, the way you meditate what is uh, the jivan uh, mukta uh, uh, also the, uh, the 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 end of life according to to the buddhism so i think these were uh, might be the, the debates 
and uh, that might have led to the the the, the decline and uh, again another way that you know the sankha uh, concept of buddhism was also the later you could see that you know in buddhism there are many uh, it it seems that actually there are hinayana mahayana vajrayana and then again another tantrayana so you have uh, many uh, such movements yana means you know turnings so ultimately what happens what buddha said and they counted so that way it seems that you know the core of the buddhist uh, uh, or buddha's teachings were ultimately declined and that may be one of uh, the other reasons uh, the the decline uh, but more of this uh, the meditative uh, reasonings that might have been uh, taking place with these great intellectuals also father i think uh... Uh, where is all these uh, in hinduism they believe in god but buddhism was an atheistic movement they do not believe in god i think that was a basic problem uh, and then uh, there was saying sarvam dukham this entire world is full of misery sarvam uh, dukham sarvam kshanikam everything it is same as uh, the hindu philosophy or advaita philosophy sarvam kshanikam but the sarvam shunyam so there is nothing here so that kind of shunya because buddha never wanted him to become a god he actually denied the existence of god but it was later his followers uh, turned him into a god and even when uh, seeing this popularity i think uh, the hindu uh, system uh, the vaishnavas they as you have pointed out already they believe that he was the ninth incarnation of lord vishnu thus assimilating him into the godhead of the hindu pantheon i think that could be one of absolutely them. yes uh, diwali you uh, brought out you know that uh, hinduism is uh, theistic uh, buddhism uh, is uh, atheistic. Atheistic. atheistic and even i heard uh, dalai lama was saying that there is no creator and uh, yeah. everything you are imposed on the creator Yeah, uh, because all the problems you create, and then you simply impose that God has created. This there is no God, so that is the way uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama, in many of the uh, the lectures, uh, he used to say. So it is theistic, non-theistic. So uh, that might be one of the very core differentiation between Buddhism and uh, Hinduism. Otherwise, most of the things are same. For example, the theory of karma. the theory of moksha they call it nirvana nibbana so rest of it the same because they have many things common in hinduism but the basic thing is theistic and uh, atheistic thank you are there any more questions well i don't see any more questions in the chat box i think Neither that uh, most more. of them became meditative father <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have gone into Advaita. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, Paljor. Ah, yes. Yeah, we have uh, my yes, uh, yes. Uh, we have uh, uh, from uh, Saraje Monastery. Uh, we have ah, Paljor yeah. uh, Lopsang Dorji. He is right. uh, he is studying for his um, uh, Geshe. That means his doctorate. Thank you, uh, um, Lopsang. And uh, please. <laughs> you may have something to say better than what we said yeah. <laughs> please enlighten us on more on yes. buddhism yes. and how it is different from our hindu philosophy mm. yeah so first of all i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to my teacher mandi uh, mathew chandra kunnar for your wonderful presentation here and uh, so regarding your presentation i have uh, two simple questions <laughs> so yes uh, uh, yeah in the yes i have also seen the some uh, some some uh, philosophical scrip scriptures which reads that uh, uh, the buddha is the avatar of the vishnu i think ninth of the avatar of the vishnu so which is the oldest scripture uh, uh, that uh, describe it as the avatar of the avatar of the vishnu and uh, which is the which is the i mean the which is the most which is the oldest scripture and uh, uh, that is uh, we can consider as as the authentic 
scripture, authentic source, which claims Buddha as the, uh, uh, as the avatar of the Vishnu. And uh, because I seen that it is good, yeah, I, I, I feel that there is no much problem if they accept as the avatar of the Vishnu. But uh, what I want is that they accept Buddha as the avatar of the Vishnu, but uh, if, they, if they accept Buddha as the avatar of the Vishnu, it is great. But if they are not going to accept the teaching of the Buddha, then it's the contradictory, right? If they would like to accept the Buddha as the avatar of the, the Vishnu and the most intelligent, uh, the, uh, intelligent uh, teacher of the world for our time, then I think it is the most uh, important, relevant to accept his teaching as, as also the teaching of the Vishnu and try to put it into the practice. And then after that, if they claim whether it is just name it Buddhism or Hinduism, it doesn't matter. What we need is we should have the way of the, we, we should have the ultimate way to bring happiness to oneself and to the world. This is our only purpose. So then what name is, whether we just name the Buddhism or we just name the Hinduism or just name it the Kishin, name doesn't matter. The point is the meaning. So uh, I've wondered that there are many great teachings, but they are not going to accept it as the teaching of the Vishnu. So uh, could you explain for this yeah, one? I think, uh, um, uh, Lobsang, uh, thank you for uh, appreciation. And you know, I remember I came and stayed in your place. I was teaching you physics and philosophy. You were teaching me meditation. So that way, a complimentary approach. And I really appreciate you came and stayed at Dharmaram. So your companions. So uh, e this is a way of, you know, mutual acceptance and mutual uh, reception. And then it is on the foundation of what dialogue. I'm not going to convert you to Christianity or you are not going to convert me into Buddhism. But, you know, there are many points which we can appreciate. Yes. Uh, yeah, the great reverence. I, I, I remember the great ways of meditation. And then uh, Dipali was also saying that, you know, the debates uh, we were having. But the, the way of making uh, an avatar, it may be an absorbing uh, the personality of uh, Buddha, not of the teaching, but as a person, and to claim that, you know, he is part of Hinduism and uh, may not be accepting the teachings of Buddha. So uh, this may be a, a very subtle way of manipulation. This is uh, what I think, rather than, uh, you know, the absorbing uh, a person into the pantheon and uh, making that, you know, we are all in one Hinduism. It is not the teaching. It is very selectively taking and uh, simply absorbing the person and the rejecting the, the teaching. If, as you said, if the teachings uh, have been also integrated, then, you know, we all human beings would have been much better. <laughs> but that maybe yeah. Deepali would uh, uh, be contributing to that, I think, uh, from your wealth of experience. <laughs> yes, uh, Reverend Paljor. Paljor, I think, is the correct name. Uh, you see, uh, the, our tradition has so many texts, as you know, but it all began with oral tradition. So most of the bhakti movement and most of the Puranas, there's a huge body of Puranas which are talking about the bhakti movement where gods have been uh, named and each of the god has that special quality. Each god is exalted from the others and is called the supreme being. So these in these Puranas, you have the bhakti movement. And since they were oral tradition, they are neither we can date them nor we can pinpoint any particular text which says that from here Buddhism, uh, Buddha was taken as, as a deity or as one of the avatars of Vishnu. So when you accept Buddha as an avatar of Vishnu, obviously he is an embodiment of Vishnu. And therefore it is Vishnu, which is not, Buddha is Vishnu and is not different from Vishnu. Therefore, Buddha's teachings separately cannot be assimilated there. 
so that was a way the hindus uh, the hindu uh, teachers at the time or we said the hindu revivalists at the time in order to accept the buddhistic tradition and buddha into the fold of hinduism they accepted him as one of the avataras that is what i understand because i have not studied the puranas so i have not can tell you on puranas is a huge body of literature and i think you can go into vishnu purana to say ab uh, about it because our hindu tradition has so many texts so yes. many texts that we cannot have one particular religious text to say but the vedas are supposed to be the beginning of all the knowledge so that is uh vedo akhilo dharma moolam so vedas are considered to be the all the basic of religion and everything emanates from there and from there in the vedas you find so many gods the names of so many gods but when you come down to the vedanta when you come to the philosophical texts of the vedic portion then instead of very many gods they all become one and then we have this concept of the nirguna brahma and the saguna brahma so buddha becomes one of the saguna brahma which is a full of attribute and in the triad of the later hindu religion brahma vishnu and mahesh brahma is the creator vishnu is the sustainer and mahesh yeah. shiva is the annihilator so vishnu is the sustainer so therefore vishnu is a popular figure and i think therefore uh, buddha was assimilated into hinduism as one of the avataras and since uh, history is a weak point in um, the hindu tradition buddha's date we can we know and uh, therefore buddha became the latest of the avataras if with my limited knowledge i can tell you only this much mm. because that is not my subject thank you <laughs> right right yes uh, thank you so much uh, for your wonderful <laughs> explanation yeah because uh, i always wondered that uh, yes i try to find uh, authentic source whether it is uh, explain in the the vedans or the uh the other uh, sh shastras uh, the the uh, the ancient scripture which is uh, which can be considered as the authentic source and where it uh, the the buddha shakyamuni gautama buddha is uh, how to say very is uh, is explained well uh, and consider as the uh, the gautam uh, 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 avatar of the uh, vishnu so yes, it yes. will be one so there are, i mean that we we cannot say that uh, just uh, catch the latter part of the the scripture because there are the many scriptures uh, uh, to accept the great teacher as the teacher uh, of the one's own system one's own lineage they just try to put the his or her name in that scripture and claim oh this is our teacher this is our lineage this is from our lineage and this is from our systems so that's why uh, uh, so it would be <laughs> i just uh, no, uh, mr pal uh, paljor you see uh, when you look at our sanskrit religious texts you hmm. see the shruti shruti means that which is heard by oral tradition so the vedas came first the four vedas hmm. and then their subsidiary or supplementary uh, uh, texts came the brahmanas the brahmanas were the uh, ritual parts of the vedic texts and then came the aranyakas where mm. the philosophical text started taking shape and then they crystallized into the vedanta that is the upanishads so and that was totally a brahmanical body of literature but for the common masses there was smriti smriti so the dharma shastras were there already going on in the oral tradition the ramayana and the mahabharata stories they were also mm. oral tradition yes. so the ramayana and the mahabharata became the religious texts of the common masses and in between when the gods were taking a definite shape from the nirguna to the saguna you have this huge body of the puranas so mm. may i suggest you can look up the vishnu purana because you will not find anything in the vedas the brahmana text the aranyaka text and in the upanishad text that is totally brahmanical but mm -hmm. you can start looking into the uh, ramayana mahabharata again where 
basic small stories and they were kshatri literature mind you but then they became the devotional the text because so many more stories were added into it and till today ramayana and the bhagavad gita bhagavad gita is the essence of all the vedas uh, of all the upanishads so that became popular so therefore in this huge body of the mahabharata with 1 lakh shlokas the gita is a jewel because it gives in in it summarizes the philosophy of the uh, upanishads mm -hmm. and that also has been incorporated into the story so that is story woven into the story and so therefore there is no authenticity even for that who created them although tradition says that uh, vyasa muni wrote uh, these texts mm -hmm. but the puranas we do not know who wrote them so they mm -hmm. were all oral tradition Mm -hmm. so i'm sorry i at the, not my subject is the puranas but i think you can uh, dwell into vishnu purana right look into that thank yeah, you yes yeah, yes uh, lobsang what you can see as uh, professor uh, deepali was saying it started as a oral tradition so somebody created yeah. and then you know later the stories were woven and on you know so if you are looking for an authentic first citation you may not find <laughs> so it may not be possible so but uh, later you know as we we are going on and uh, the or oral tradition when it is written down so you maybe between uh, uh, the 12th century or uh, maybe 10th century to 16th century in between maybe that was the the time where you know they might have i am not sure but yeah. uh, so this oral into the crystallized the form of Uh, right apart from that father uh, mm. because history is a very weak point in sanskrit because it was traditionally said you know brahma satyam jagat mithya this whole world is just an illusion so nobody documented it <laughs> so we do not have any you know even for our literature there are no uh, documented dates it is only now when we go to only harshvardhana who comes in the 6th century we then start saying okay if harshvardhana has mentioned these people these poets they must have preceded him if harshvardhana has been mentioned that means these people came after him so history has been a very weak point then we look into the stone inscriptions and other inscriptions and then we start dating so even ramayana and mahabharata we only make conjectures because they were parallel they were uh, running alongside they were the uh, lit, uh, religion of the masses where the brahmanical literature was only the stronghold of the brahmins so therefore we cannot put a citation there and we cannot say for sure that this is the text which was said in such and such era so therefore history is a very weak point in our uh, sanskrit tradition mm -hmm. thank you So, does uh, Katari has a question? Mm. You raise a uh, your hand. Yeah, if you have, please have your question. Who is the name? Yes, thank you so yeah. much for recognizing Katari. me. Yeah, this is this is brother Kiran. Yeah, 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 yeah. In my in one of the talks, we are uh, so in conversation. Just I was clarified and was raised one more question. Uh, that when buddha was alive and uh, when he was teaching i think uh, he might be not accepted that uh, to say that uh, to consider is one of the avataras which i felt that uh, it is already given later and much later, uh, people, even, uh, much later and then uh, it's it may not be not that much needed uh, than to say whether the attribution or not but the the core point of his teaching is being sidelined i felt uh, because i i to read uh, buddhism and so on so uh, there was there is a uh, lot of lot of insights are there and uh, hidden wisdom is uh, being treasured there uh, in I, i have attended uh, too many meetings also but uh, people are sidelined the teachings and then highlighted only later what is happened and all these things just only to share we, which we are even uh, almost 15 minutes we are discussing nothing of uh, something of talk but only of uh, is uh, letter of attributions that we have been uh, heard just to share i want to say thank you uh, i think that you know what he said is uh, correct 
it's only attributions and we don't know exactly what data and all so those who are uh, uh, following this as a course the question will be uh, this one how uh, shankaracharya reformed hindu uh, tradition and how do you think that your own religion could be reformed from your perspective see the question is how shankaracharya reformed the hindu uh, religion and how do you think that you could reform your own religion whether you are hindu or christian or whatever you know so this is looking into from the perspective of a reformer so this will be the question for our uh, uh, assignment <laughs> 400 words okay friends uh, yeah we are running out of the time so we will now close our program on behalf of all those who are here on the screen we would like to express uh, deepest gratitude to father matthew for enlightening us and i mean throwing great insights on the uh, teaching the life and the philosophy of sri sankara and also uh, a great thanks to the pali banat who was uh, moderating the session so it was really awesome so and then you really you really put i mean great insights uh, with, i mean upon the talks thank you so much ma'am and as father say yeah he has just announced the uh, question and our next lecture will be by swami mahamuni srita mahagade that will be on 8 july that is next thursday on the same time 6 pm and we look forward to see you all again next thursday at 6 pm thank you so much everyone Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for this enlightening discussion. And it was not a Digvijaya. 